Hi guys, I'm back and this time we're going to start to talk about the content in chapter seven, um, which is kind of about the air movement in the water and then the impacts of the air or atmospheric component in the soil. So I'm going to share my screen. And start. Okay, so why do so soils need gases, right? We've thought a lot about the importance of water in the soil, but we have said a few times that we don't want all the pore spaces in the soil to be filled with water because we need gas down there too. So why would that be? Yeah, hopefully you're thinking of the reason that we want to get oxygen down in the soil for lots of organisms that live there. So Plants. Plants actually do respiration as well. We think of plants as photosynthesizers and we know that that uses carbon dioxide, but plants also do the same respiration process that animals and other organisms do, where they take oxygen, they combine it with sugar, and they burn the sugar that they made um, to create energy to grow and make new cells. So plants need oxygen, plant roots do but also all the other organisms like microbes that do all the decomposition and nutrient recycling in the soil cannot survive without oxygen. For the most part, animals, all the insects and earthworms and then mammals like this little mole need air, fungi. So there's a lot of organisms down in the soil and they all need oxygen. And so we need to have some atmospheric connectivity between the air and the soil matrix. So, um, how much gas exchange occurs, so how much movement of gas is there into the soil and then back out of the soil, um, that depends on a few different things. The first one is just kind of the space. Is there space between the soil solids? So we can call that soil macroporosity. We talked a lot about the fact that the micropores, tiny spaces like in between clays, are not very good at moving air. So we want those big spaces in between aggregates or in between sand grains to be able to move air. So if we have those spaces, then that can help increase our rate of gas exchange. Also, the amount of water that's in the soil that's taking up those spaces is going to um, impact us. So in this case, the more water there is, the less gas exchange there is. So even soil with the same pore space um, can have a much lower rate of gas exchange if there's lots of water flooding the soil. And then the third component is the rate of oxygen consumption. So if oxygen flows down into the soil and then is used very rapidly by plant roots, by microbes, by other animals and fungi, then there will be a drawdown of the oxygen, which will actually pull more oxygen into the soil um, according to the laws of partial pressure that we'll talk more about later. So we need to have the space. We can't have that space totally filled up with water. And then we also need to consider how fast gases like oxygen are being used up. Okay, so we've talked a lot about um, macro pore space in the soil so far. So hopefully this is not a surprise to you. Um, we know where we have soil that's aggregated together in clumps because of sticky OM or organic matter, because of polyvalent cations that act like strong magnets, things like calcium um, or clays, all those things are gonna cause the soil particles to be sticky. They're gonna stick together in clumps or aggregates. And so there's gonna be bigger spaces in between them. Um, roots can help push apart particles to make, make nice channels. And then these low bulk density or uncompacted soils are gonna have much more capacity to hold both water, but also air than compacted soils um, that we see in the right picture compared to the left picture. Okay, so that's kind of a review. Um, then just conceptually, where we have lots of water in those spaces, we don't have space for air. So we can't have both water and air in the same space at the same time. And if we have too much water and then not enough air or poor soil aeration, we might have um, limited plant growth or we might have limited microbial activity that might be related to poor plant growth. 
Um, and sometimes we'll start to see drop offs, drop offs in plant productivity if we have less than 20% of the pore space filled with water over time. So this might happen if we have kind of compacted soils where there's just not that much pore space to start out with and then we're watering them hoping to get our plants to grow. Um, we might see that the plants are not able to grow in that environment. There's just not enough air exchange there. So that is like the picture on the left, these beets that aren't doing very well. And then on the right, um, we have a situation where a beavers have built a dam that's pooled up water on the soil. So now um, pore spaces are filled with water instead of air and these different trees around the edge of the area um, that used to have dry soil and now have wet soil are starting to die. So both examples of what happens when we have too much water in the soil for the types of plants that are trying to grow there. Um, here's another picture of a wet meadow from Palumas County. Um, so again, this is a natural ecosystem, um, but we see that tree, these lodgepole pine trees, um, some are able to survive, but many are dying. And that's because basically their roots are too wet. They're not able to get the oxygen that they need to survive. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about wetland later, but there are of course certain plants that live in these soggy saturated environments like marshes, um, and they have um, specialized um, characteristics that allow them to actually pipe oxygen down to their roots so that they get the oxygen they need to be able to survive. So um, in the picture on the left, there's some bald cypress plants um, in, the Evergra um, in the Everglades, and they have this kind of elevated root structure where they have some structure that's going down below the water, but then they um, have um, this kind of like, they're on stilts basically, so they have roots that are able to access the oxygen that they need. And then many plants, um, things like rice or other wetland plants, um, have what are called arenchyma cells. They're these specialized cells that are like little tubes that allow them to move oxygen from above the water surface down below the water surface inside the plant. So they don't need to be absorbing oxygen in their plant roots. They can pump the oxygen that their plant roots need down from the interior. So anyway, that's why some plants can live in wet environments, but most plants are not adapted to do this. Um, and I have a little question here, what soil order is the soil that's mostly very saturated, kind of marshy conditions? Anybody remember? That would be a histosol soil. Okay, here's another example, flooded rice fields. California grows a lot of rice, and we see that these areas get flooded um, in the wintertime. Okay, so how does the gas actually move into the soil? Um, and this will explain that kind of third component, um, which is about the rate of oxygen um, use in the soil. So we need to think about how the oxygen gets down there to understand that component. Well, the first way that some um, oxygen could get into the soil is a process that's called mass flow. And in this case, it's just like a bunch of air molecules are basically pulled by differences in pressure or pushed by something like rain um, or other air molecules and they kind of enter an area on mass. So there can be some mass flow movement of air kind of from above the surface down into the soil. That's a small component but much more important is a process that's called diffusion and diffusion is defined as a passive transport so there's not necessarily any other external force pushing a molecule, but instead the movement or the transport happens just because of the inherent kinetic motion of molecules. So what that means is that um, unless you're at absolute zero, any molecule is slowly moving and vibrating around and bumping into other molecules. And as it kind of slowly randomly bumps around into other things at some point, it might encounter a little space at the surface of the soil that would cause it to go down into the soil. So as it's just kind of randomly moving around at some point, a certain number of molecules are just kind of randomly enter a pore space that's going to cause them to go down into the soil. And um, what happens is that um, this motion is 
like sort of random in which direction the different molecules are moving. But there is one general trend, or there's, there's so few general trends. One general trend is that molecules tend to move away from areas where there's lots of molecules towards areas where there's fewer molecules. So where there are lots of molecules, there's a lot more collisions. These things are bumping into each other and they kind of push away from one another. And that causes molecules that are packed together to just kind of move apart from each other over time. And we call this um, a movement that's down gradient. The molecules just over time end up, because of kinetic motion, moving from an area where they're packed together towards an area where they're less packed together. Okay. And in particular, this happens um, within each particular type of atmospheric molecule. So in an area where there's a bunch of oxygen molecules, even if there's not that many other kinds of molecules around, if there's a lot of oxygen molecules, they'll end up over time moving away from the area where the oxygen is concentrated into the area where oxygen is not so concentrated. Even if that second space might have lots of other kinds of molecules. So it might not be like an empty space, um, but if there's not as much oxygen there, the oxygen will migrate over time from the place where there's more of it to the place where there's less of it. And this is this concept of partial pressure. So I have some more images on the next slide to help us understand this. So basically partial pressure tells us that the amount of pressure that a specific gas um, would exert on its container if it were the only gas present. So Gas molecules in the air bump into things around them, including like a container that they would be in, like a room um, or a soil pour or like a beaker, glass jar or something. Okay, so when we're measuring, we can measure the overall atmospheric pressure. What's the pressure of all the molecules inside that jar, for instance, getting bumping up against the jar? That would be the total atmospheric pressure. But then the partial pressure would be the pressure that is exerted from just one type of gas alone. So in the air, there's lots of nitrogen, there's also lots of oxygen, there's also other things like carbon dioxide. And so we can calculate the partial pressure from each individual gas. And the partial pressure is proportional to the gas concentration. So if you have um, a gas like the, the air at sea level, that's 78% nitrogen, then 78% of the pressure that a jar that contains that air is experiencing is from the nitrogen. And then if the oxygen makes up 21% of the molecules in the air, then it's going to be exerting 21% of the total pressure, um, and so on and so forth. So at sea level, we record that the atmospheric pressure has um, a pressure value of one atmosphere. An atmosphere is a type of pressure measurement. So we know that 0.78 atmospheres, or 78% of the total pressure is from nitrogen, and 0.21 atmospheres, or 21% of the total pressure is from oxygen. Okay, and then carbon dioxide, which makes up 0.03, 6% of the total air would be 0, 0.00, so we're adding two decimal places before um, each of these values, 0, 036 atmosphere. So a very, very small percent of the total pressure would be made from carbon dioxide. Okay, so if we had two jars then that were connected with one another, and on one side, we had 80% N2 or nitrogen gas and 20% oxygen gas. And then on the other side, we had 20% nitrogen gas and 80% oxygen gas. Um, even if overall we had the same total number of molecules in both jars, and so we had the same total pressure in both jars, so in this case, our pressure units are recorded as um, millimeters of mercury, which is another unit of pressure. But in this case, the total pressure is the same, but even though the total pressure and the total number of molecules in both jars are the same, what we will see due to just random diffusion or random kind of motion of molecules over time 
is that the larger number of nitrogen molecules on the left will randomly migrate over towards the area where there's not as many nitrogen molecules, and the large number of oxygen molecules on the right will slowly and randomly over time start to migrate over towards the area where there's fewer oxygen molecules, and eventually over time, the concentration of these different gases will start to equal out. So we have a movement of nitrogen away from the place where it's concentrated to where it's less concentrated, and we have a movement of oxygen away from the place where it's concentrated to a place where it's less concentrated, okay? So this is this idea of partial pressures driving the movement of gases, and this applies to different jars, but it also applies to what happens between the atmosphere and the soil air, okay? So um, in the atmosphere, we have um, gases including nitrogen, including oxygen, and including small amounts of carbon dioxide. In the soil below the surface, we have pore spaces that are occupied by these molecules. So in this diagram, there's a soil solid on the right, a soil solid on the left, and then this pore space contains all these different molecules, okay? And in the pore spaces in the soil, we know that there's different organisms that are using up oxygen. And as they're using up the oxygen, they're also releasing carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide starts to become more concentrated in the soil pores as the oxygen becomes relatively less concentrated. Okay, so um, what we see then is that we'll have a difference in the partial pressure of both oxygen and carbon dioxide below ground in the soil pores relative to the atmosphere. And because there's a connection between the atmosphere and the, poils, the soil pores, then we'll start to see this diffusion that drives the carbon dioxide away from the soil pore up into the air where it's less concentrated over time and drives the oxygen from the air down into the soil pore where it's less concentrated. Okay, so over time, what we can see is that CO2 concentrations in the soil pores can get much, much, much higher um, than the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which are less than 0.1%. They can get up as high as like 10%, and that would particularly be true like lower in the soil or in soil pores that are not very connected to the atmosphere. And then again, diffusion driven by these differences in partial pressure is gonna cause kind of just the random bouncing around of these molecules to move the carbon dioxide out and then move the oxygen back in. And the bigger the difference in concentrations and partial pressures is, the faster we're gonna have a gas exchange. So if you have like microbes in the soil that are just using up um, oxygen really fast and pumping out carbon dioxide really quickly, then we're going to set up this big discrepancy, this big difference in the um, concentrations and partial pressures below ground and above ground, and that's going to cause a more rapid turnover of gases pulling oxygen in faster. Okay, so here's a diagram that shows along the bottom, the percentage of CO2 in the soil air, okay? And remember above ground, the percentage of CO2 is very low, less than 0.1%, okay? And then on the left, we're seeing soil depth. So the top of the graph is showing the surface. And then as we go down below the surface, we're getting deeper and deeper towards the bottom of the graph. So not surprisingly, the lowest concentrations of CO2 are near the surface, right? Because we're not having a lot of buildup of CO2. Anytime CO2 builds up, it's pushed back out of the soil towards the atmosphere and oxygen can get back down to replace it. There's also a difference between the wet season and the dry season. When the soil is drier, we already said, then or when it's wetter, there's less space to move air around, so this exchange can't happen as quickly or as efficiently. When it's drier, it can happen better. So overall, we're having lower concentrations of CO2 buildup in dry soil and higher concentrations buildup in wet soil. 
Okay. And then the deeper down we go in the soil, the more carbon dioxide buildup there would be because these pore spaces are going to be just more disconnected from the surface. So over time, these differences in partial pressure that are becoming concentrated as CO2 is building up will drive diffusion and those CO2 molecules will randomly bounce their way around in these soil pores and end up coming out of the soil into the air, but it's just gonna take longer. There's not as direct of a path. And so more CO2 builds up before that process is able to happen. Okay, so that should kind of illustrate um, how this gas exchange is happening. Okay, so um, when we have these different areas in the soil that may have lots of oxygen or may not have lots of oxygen, okay, because they're compacted, because there's lots of water, we have this interesting series of reactions that are called redox reactions going on um, in the soil. So you may have heard of redox reactions if you took chemistry in high school or taking chemistry um, here. But basically redox reactions are these pairs of reactions where one particular substance is being what's called oxidized and the other substance is being is called um, reduced. It's experiencing a reduction. Okay, and so the way that uh, many people are taught to remember this is that there's a little saying, Leo goes grr, right? Leo the lion says grr. So L-E-O stands for loss of electrons equals oxidation and grr, G-E-R, gain of electrons equals a reduction. So on the most kind of just chemical atomic level, what's happening in an oxidation is that you're losing electrons and you become oxidized in that process. And if you're being reduced, you're gaining electrons. That's what a reduction is. Okay. Um, and um, oxidation is often associated with a reaction with oxygen, which is where it comes up or where we get that name from. And there's many different substances in the soil, things like iron, that are going to have slightly different forms um, when they are oxidized as opposed to reduced. So in the presence of oxygen, they'll have one particular oxidized form. And then when the oxygen isn't there, if there's too much water, too much carbon dioxide, not enough gas exchange, then they'll have a reduced form. And these different forms of different chemical compounds like iron and many other things um, are going to behave really differently in the soil and so have different implications for plant growth, um, nutrient availability, potential toxicity, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so again, iron is like the classic example that most people have all seen before, whether or not they understood this was an oxidation or a reduction. Um, situation. So basically, um, iron, which has a chemical symbol of Fe, remember, can exist in an oxidized form where it has a three plus form, meaning it's lost three electrons, the negatively charged particles that are outside the atom, relative to the number of protons that it has in its nucleus. Okay, so that's an oxidized form. The reduced form, it's only lost two electrons and so it has a plus two charge rather than a plus three plus three charge and sometimes you'll hear these called ferric versus ferrous um, iron but the way that you would recognize the difference is that the oxidized form of iron usually appears red whereas the reduced form of iron re appears more gray or like a greenish gray color so when we see red soils, they're often red because the iron has been exposed to oxygen over periods of time. And so lots of the iron there has become oxidized and appears red. However, if that same parent material was breaking down to form a soil in kind of like a wetland environment or a super compacted environment where there wasn't good oxygen flow, Instead, the iron in that soil might be in a reduced form where it appeared gray or green. And we can call those environments that don't have adequate access to oxygen anaerobic environments. So aerobic means 
oxygen uses oxygen, right? Like aerobic exercise, you're breathing a lot. And then anaerobic means lacking oxygen. So in wetland environments near streams, we often have soils that are kind of like a slimy gray green color. And that's because of this particular um, form of iron that exists in these areas where oxygen is lacking in the soil pores. Um, another form of um, reduced um, chemical compound that you might have encountered before is when you have like a sulfur smell and this also might be found in like a wetland environment and this is created by hydrogen sulfide so this is a form of sulfur that is created in reduced environments um, when there's not enough oxygen around the sulfur can't react and bond with oxygen it, it bonds with hydrogen instead and this is created by lots of different kinds of microbes or bacteria that are specifically adapted to live in these anaerobic, these oxygen lacking environments, okay? Um, and so we might smell the stinky smell. And then again, we might see the color of the soil look this kind of gray green color as opposed to a more red color. So the picture on the right is showing kind of a grayer color below and then a redder color on top where there's a better connection with the atmosphere. So same pair of material, but reduced environment down low where there's lots of water filling up pore spaces, blocking oxygen, and then red on top where oxygen is available. Um, here's some more pictures, um, just different kinds of mottled colored soil is often associated with these. Um, environments where soil is then wet, wetted and dried repeatedly and consistently. So the water table is kind of moving back and forth or there's flooding and then pullback of rivers. So we usually have kind of like redder areas where there's like root channels, um, bigger kind of macro pore highways that air can move down into. And then there's a lot of kind of grayer or what's sometimes called glade soil um, in the areas where the water is kind of blocking the access to oxygen. So aerobic and anaerobic in the same place might look like this modeled um, area with like little red or orange fingers um, in a more glade background. Okay, so to review, factors affecting soil aeration and oxidation are the macropore space, we need the space there in the first place. If we don't have space, we can't move air into the soil. Okay. Two, the amount of water that's present in the soil could either block air from entering, or if there's not a lot of water, can provide opportunity for air to enter. Okay. Then um, the third component we said is basically just the concentrations of the gases in the soil are gonna drive diffusion of gases. And so if we have a situation where there's high respiration, basically where oxygen is being used up quickly in the soil by microbes or other things, um, then we're going to kind of draw down the levels of oxygen, which is gonna create this vacuum essentially that's gonna pull more oxygen in from the air. So if we do things like add organic matter, that's gonna speed up and build microbial populations and speed up microbial activity, we can be using up oxygen and the, the more we use it, the faster it's gonna be replaced, okay? And then finally, um, we've seen some examples that soil depth is also very important in determining the air access. So, Obviously, the deeper you are, just the more disconnected you are from the atmosphere and gases like oxygen. So you have a longer pathway to travel um, to get down to soil pores at depth. There's lower rates of bioturbation. Um, I'm not sure if we've used that term before, but that's basically like the mixing and moving around of soil by organisms, right? There's not as many earthworms moving around and creating channels six feet below the surface as there are six inches below the surface. There's also fewer fine roots deep down. And so all of those things kind of um, combine to mean that it's much more difficult for air to kind of find its way, find channels, and travel all the way down to soil at depth. 
Okay, so why is this important? Why are we bothering to talk about it? Well, this has important ecological impacts. So in places where we have poor aeration, where there's not um, oxygen down in the soil, we're going to have um, not an opportunity for a lot of biological activity to take place. So there's gonna be a slow breakdown of things like um, organic matter in the soil, slower soil formation um, in these places. And then also because there's often big impacts in that are created because of very different chemical behaviors of oxidized and reduced forms of different elements. So for instance, carbon can exist in a reduced or an oxidized form. When it's reduced, it's usually the carbon is reduced and it's reduced because it has reacted with um, hydrogen and it's bonded with hydrogen to form things like methane, CH4, okay? And that's different than when carbon reacts with oxygen, which oxidizes the carbon, okay, to form CO2. And both CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases, but methane is 25 times better at capturing heat in our atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So if we have lots and lots of extensive wetlands that are producing methane rather than aerated soil that's producing CO2, we could be really accelerating the rate of global warming that we're experiencing, okay? Um, another example would be sometimes reduced forms are more mobile, able to move around in the soil and be more accessible um, more effectively. So um, in the case of, um, Iron, the reduced form of iron, releases P, which is phosphorus, um, from an insoluble um, FEPO3 compound. And so when this happens, when the iron becomes re reduced, um, it breaks apart from the oxygen and the phosphorus that it had in this compound. And um, then the phosphorus can start to add extra nutrients to water, which can lead to a eutrophication process that we talked about when we talked about water quality. This is when we have like algae blooms um, and then bacterial blooms that feed on the algae blooms that draw down oxygen and water and create ecosystem problems, okay? So in an, an oxidized environment, that process wouldn't happen. Um, in some cases, reduced forms of elements might be more mobile and potentially more toxic um, than oxidized forms. So arsenic and selenium um, are both elements and they can exist in oxidized and reduced forms. And in reduced forms, in both these cases, arsenic and selenium can be really toxic to animals um, and to humans. And so if we have them in soils, and then we have like wetlands and then we're maybe drinking the water or coming in contact with that water. We can see different kinds of cancers or we can see different kinds of wildlife experiencing cancers or birth defects um, because of exposure to reduced forms of these particular kinds of compounds. Um, and then sometimes the oxidized form of a particular element might be more toxic. So chromium is another element um, and chromium 6 plus as opposed to the reduced form chromium 3 plus um, are different forms um, and in this case the oxidized form of chromium 6 plus is particularly um, toxic and when we find this in soils and water groundwater that people drink and stuff it can also be like a real cancer um, and birth defect creator. Um, so we want to be really aware of the kinds of conditions that exist around us and think about how that may be impacting our ability to different um, levels of toxicity um, in our soils and in the water that we might be pumping out of our soils. Um, here's a particular example um, showing um, this chromium 6 plus, this toxic version of chromium that's both toxic and more mobile, moves around more easily in groundwater. And we said that's different than the reduced form of chromium 3 plus, which is relatively immobile, meaning it bonds to soil and kind of stays in place and is also not as toxic. And in this particular case, um, they did a study where they were trying to remove 
chromium six plus from the soil by transforming it into chromium three plus. So taking this toxic compound and trying to kind of clean the soil from it. It's difficult to take out of the soil, but they were hoping by transforming the oxidized form to the reduced form, they would reduce health impacts. And so in this case, what they did is they added lots of dried manure, which has lots of organic matter, okay? And that was an electron donor, that particular um, organic matter usually has lots of available electrons in it. And so those electrons were able to oxidize the chromium, um, or sorry, they were able to reduce the chromium and um, basically uh, cha change the form of the chromium from oxygen or chromium six plus to chromium three plus. Um, and as they added more organic matter, they were able to um, create a hundredfold decrease in the rate of this toxic chromium form. Okay, so we see lines of a little bit of organic matter or no organic matter added, 12 milligrams of organic matter per hectare added and 50 milligrams of organic matter per hectare added. And the more organic matter they were able to add, they were able to change the oxygen and the oxidized and reduced forms of these compounds in the soil. So anyway, chemistry is important. I know you guys haven't all taken chemistry, so we're not gonna get into a lot more specific details about how this works, but understanding gas exchange and then the transformation of different forms of compounds that exist in the soil um, is very important for both like growers, um, but also water managers, groundwater managers, um, surface water managers, and public health um, people, wildlife folks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we're gonna take a break here. And then we're going to talk about wetlands.